Welcome everybody to another episode of Getting APIs to Work and more importantly to What Would the Web Do? The regular segment with Mike Amundsen. Hey Mike, how are you doing? Hey, good to see you. How are you doing? Good, good, good. So today we'll talk about standards and why it's important that you think about standards. We will talk about that you're using standards, like it or not, and we'll talk about some patterns, how to use standards, some maturity level of standards, and also we'll give you some examples of organizations that are active in standards development. Let's get us started. Mike, why do people use standards? Why does everybody use standards, even though they might think, oh, I'm not doing that? Right. So we in this IT space, when we're all separated uh, by country, by culture, by land mass, by water, we have to have some kind of way to agree on things. So we end up using standards all the time. We've been using standards as a way to get computers to connect to each other for 40, 50 years, all the way to TCP IP as just the you know packet uh, standards. HTTP is, is a standard that almost all of us in the API space use all the time without even really thinking about it, right? Um, you know, I, I saw this little joke, there's two fish in the, this, uh, younger fish is saying to the older fish, okay, explain to me water again, I don't get it. When it's all <laughs> around us, you know, when it's all around us, we don't notice. So we need these standards as a way to consistently communicate with each other, how we communicate, not what, what is really sort of what we add to the mix. But we use standards all the time. And as you and I have said before, we're using standards. Let's do it well. Let's take advantage of it. Be aware of it and, and use it as part of everyday design and implementation and management. And then we get ahead of the game. That's my point of view. Yeah. Yeah. And just think about how you're seeing that, right? You're watching this in a browser um, yeah. on your phone, right? And you're like the data gets transported in a certain way. It's running in a certain environment, either your browser or on your phone which also operates in a certain way, right? And all these things can only work when there are standards in place that make that work. And, yep. and it's no different for APIs, right? It's just, we don't want to build something for the browser. We want to build something for machines. But apart from that, I think the fundamental layers are pretty much the same. So what would you say from the API point of view are the most important standards that most people are using that, that kind of established that, that groundwork that you can just rely on? Well, you know, I think I mentioned one, the, one of them already, HTTP. That's kind of the, the, the base level for a lot of standards. There, there's actually other ones that are at that same level. We used to say OSI levels. I don't know if that's really a thing anymore. Uh, but um, MQTT oh, is oh. another standard. What's, what do we say? I, I just said, you know, OSI is just for kind of old people, I think, by now. Most people will just wonder what that is. So Con Confessions, confessions. MQTT has been around almost the same amount of time as HTTP and takes a very, you know, different point of view as to how you transfer application level information, right? TLS is really a given for, for doing, a, uh, securing the, the data in flight from place to place. You know, we use uh, JSON a lot. I used to use XML a lot. You're in, then you're into things like GraphQL, which is really not a sort of a format standard as much as it is a kind of a protocol or an agreed upon standard. Um, so there are a lot of these sort of basic pieces that I know I have to use every day. You may be able to think of other ones that you use as well. Yeah, of course. but. So, so these ones are really fundamental, right? If you, yeah. like you really need HTTP and without that you can't get data to the other side. So that's really important. But let's, let's look into kind of different ways how you can use standards. So we, we also discussed this idea of going all in and just doing something according to a standard or kind of when it comes to APIs, being a little bit more flexible in how you can use standards. Yeah. What are the two models that you, would be able to identify there how you can use standards. Yeah, I think um, um, this sort of this all-in approach is is actually pretty common, especially at like industry. You might say in Japan, kiritsu levels, like you know, uh, 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 verticals. Uh, banking has one called the Banking Industry uh, Architecture Network or, or BIAN standard, and these kinds of standards establish 
sort of from start to finish, from, you know, from login to doing all the data transfers, all the actions, all the methods, all the functionality, all the data types, they're all in one set of standards. So if I want to say start a you know a banking software business and be a middleware for banking, I would adopt the buy-in standard set, and I can I now know that I'll plug in with just about any device that has any anything to do with banking. So there's these mono I call them kind of monolithic, right? They're sort of monolithic standards groups, and banking is one of them. Fire the the fast interchange for health uh, is another one. There's a handful of these, but they're not the only one, and and a lot of times you don't have just one industry vertical that you're dealing with. You're actually dealing with lots of individual bits. And then I think you and I kind of think of those as modular standards. So I might use um, a standard for encryption, a standard for authentication, a standard for access control, maybe a standard for representing uh, data models and stuff like that. So I would have to you know, kind of pick and choose and that becomes a kind of a building block space, right? And you know a lot about building blocks, right? Yeah, I think this is a good point actually to to have this little plug for the IETF HTTP API building blocks working group, right? Which is doing exactly that. So what this working group is working on is developing those building blocks, which you can then then kind of assemble in the way that you you want to build your API. And I think what more and more organizations are doing is they are establishing API guidelines. And as part of these guidelines, which also have some general practices in there and, and whatever, but it also has these parts in there. So one thing that I see more is, for example, one thing to say, if you are reporting errors, use the standard, right? There is a standard for error reporting. You probably don't need something else. So why not just use that standard, right? And it's always, I think with the standards, it's always important to think that it actually is good for everybody involved. It's good for those who use the standard because they don't need to invent a new way of doing that, which saves them time. And it's good for those who use that API because they understand, for example, how that API reports errors because they probably have encountered that standard before. So they don't need to learn that part of the API. And I yeah, think I... this is kind of the most valuable right. part of this module-based approach, right? Where you say, I only design those parts that I need to design. And for the other things, I use standardized building blocks so that what I build is the best possible balance of what I need and what I can reuse. And then I combine that into a design that is easy, as easy to understand and use as I can make it. Yeah, I, I tend to think of this uh, in programming Right, we have this "don't repeat yourself" principle. Right, the dry yep. idea. Why do I have to keep inventing error formats? There's a standardized error format that I can simply adopt. So that reduces the effort for me. That sort of lowers the barrier of entry for me when I'm designing my API, like you say. And at the same time, it also lowers the barrier of entry for consumers if they've used the the HTTP problem details. RFC before, if they've implemented a library that understands how that error reporting works, they can just drop that in. They can just drop in their support for it. And in fact, when I look, this is me, when I look at consuming APIs, I'm actually looking for what are the standards that you use? It's sort of like the next level of the, of the HTTP and the TLS and the TCP IP we were talking about before. Make it easy for me to use your API. I know you're using those building blocks. I can start to plug in my libraries that I've gotten from GitHub because they're shared or, or, or even if I've created my own. And that makes it easier uh, for me. So I like the modular approach. I don't like the all in as much. Uh, I understand the attraction and the value of it, but I like the modular approach because it lets me sort of plug in pieces relatively quickly. And I like that a lot. So let's have a brief look at how these standards even come to existence. I think it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, how do we come from realizing something is done over and over again to actually then at some point having a standard for it. And we've identified like this little maturity model, maybe we can call it this, something like this, how a standard kind of evolves from this just practice into being an actual standard. Right. And so we start with level one is just pattern. So what would a pattern be? 
So, so the way I think of this is, um, you know, you're in a team, you're trying to solve a problem, and we all we all sort of adopt a kind of a general thought, a general way. You know, the way to handle um, transactions is like this. We'll have this kind of interchange between two parties. I send you this message, you send me a post back or whatever. We sort of develop a little pattern, and and people tend to do the same thing. Um, and uh, it's not really well disciplined. It's not really well defined, but it's the way we do things here. A lot of times I go into a shop and they say, no, 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 this is how we do it here. And I'm like, oh, that's a nice pattern. Um, so I use patterns a lot. And actually, sometimes I document them. You can read lots and lots of books on patterns. Most pattern books focused on code, but I'm seeing more and more focus on protocol and web messaging. So I think patterns is a good start. It's usually the way people think about it and they start using the same way of doing it over and over again. And when I, when I start realizing that I am using a pattern, I think right then the next level we can look at is that I actually start using that pattern in the exact same way, right? I basically make it easy for myself to do that work by saying, every time I see that I'm doing this, this is exactly how I'm going to do this. And I, that's, what I think you could call a personal standard, it's it's not really a standard, so to speak, but it, it's some level of, it's a little bit more well-defined than just a pattern because it says, you know, I'm doing it like this, and then I can have code for it, I can have a library for it, right? That makes it easier for me. Now then... Yep. And the way, the way I'm just going to say, the way I think about that too is, you know, my team uses this pattern. The other teams I interact with start saying, hey, that's actually kind of cool. Can you explain that to me? Oh, I really don't have time to explain it. Let me write it out. And I write out a pattern. And now we start to share that sort of personal, like you say, personal standard. And now it's a little bit more formalized. It's not, it hasn't been reviewed or anything, but now it's easy for me to sort of scale that pattern to sort of a, a personal standard or an internal standard or sort of some shared kind of idea, right? That's the way I think. And then if, if people start liking it, I think we can go up one level and say, okay, and now it may see adoption, let's say in a certain community where people just say, okay, I like what you do there. It works for me. I'll, I'll also do it like this, right? And then we have these kind of corporate standards or whatever you call them or patterns. Well, no, let's not call them patterns. Corporate standards, <laughs> right? Or community standards, whatever these things are. They don't have any... They don't have any official standing, but as uptake grows, they actually might become fairly important because you already have quite a sizable community maybe that is using that, that standard of doing things. And, and yeah. once we are at that point, what's the next step then? What's the next level going up from that corporate or community standard? Right. So, so you get to this point where maybe, you know, large corporations or corporations with lots of influence, they have lots of consumers. So everybody adopts that. Then they start to attract other businesses around there. And so it's, it's sort of in that vertical again. And what's happened is a lot of other companies who want to interact with that large corporation or with that community start to adopt a kind of a vertical. It's sort of organizations of the same type or people who are trying to solve the same kind of problem. So I think of them as kind of vertical standards, standards for sharing API definitions, standards for uh, expressing uh, data you know, requests, data queries, and stuff like that. So this becomes a kind of a sort of like a consortium or, or some other kind of organization that is specific for solving a particular problem. And I kind of think of those as vertical standards. And then the the final and the glorious um, phase of being a standard then is to be an actual standard. And I think that is when organizations start realizing, hey, we really should write this down and also get some feedback maybe and, and get some, some uh, review from others who might use that. And then it might actually go through a kind of formal process where it gets documented, it sees some review, and then it gets published by by some organization, it doesn't, I mean, there's a whole bunch of standards organizations out there, but I think then it, it does have like an official standing in some shape or form. And sometimes it's even that organizations who are developing things and would like to use those building blocks, 
they kind of are only allowed to use building blocks when they have an official standing, because otherwise you're kind of a little bit, you know, building on <laughs> like quicksand, right? You're, yeah. you're not quite sure what's going to happen. So I, I find sometimes I find that very understandable that they say, you know, I like that, but if it's not really approved and stable, I I don't feel so good about using it. Yeah, and I think there that you bring up a really good point. There's at some point what happens in these consortiums is is it gets wide enough that there are actually some competing interests in the same overall space. And one of the advantages of global standards, these large standards bodies organizations, is it releases people from getting involved in licensing and lots of other problems. Almost all of these are open standards in some way. There are a few that are not, but a lot of times the real attractor is we can't use a standard that hasn't been, reached this level of having global review from lots of smart minds that's free from a particular competitive advantage or intellectual property issue, then we can start using it. So there is a little bit of this challenge. When you start to attract a large enough community, there are some competing interests, there are some intellectual property questions, these global standards groups really help us kind of level the playing field for everyone involved. And that's especially true when you sort of get involved in the kinds of organizations that do these sort of standards. They all have their sort of their own ethos about it. But I, the real advantage, you think of it as like sort of like the top of the you know pinnacle or whatever. But the real advantage for me is that it's been seen by lots and lots of people, even in competitive cases. It's not just a, a monolithic kind of point of view. It's actually a global point of view, which I really like in this, in this standard style. And I think one thing we've also we haven't mentioned so far is I think sometimes it's also clear that these building blocks may have the easiest way to come into existence when they are in, let's say, non-competitive or non-differentiating parts, right? So, for example, when we go back to this example of error reporting, right, that it's kind of hard to imagine that your API will differentiate itself by having better error reporting than others. So that really is something where you can say, well, that's just how we all do it. Yep. But then again, right, there may be other things where you really put a lot of design effort into it because you think I can actually make that better than others. And that part may have a harder time to become a standard because there is maybe a differentiating aspect to it. But I think that's, the, that's what I find fascinating also with that IETF working group on building blocks, right, that we will probably see that many of those aspects that, that get proposed in that working group will be kind of these non-differentiating factors that are just useful and that a lot of people just say, yeah, that would be nice if I could do that more easily and then hopefully the community gets together. Yep, that's a good, that's a good point. And since we just mentioned this IETF working group, let's, let's also briefly look at the different kinds of organizations that come up with those standards and how they're doing it. And I know that you have also been involved with the IETF for a long time now. And yep. since we've mentioned that, let's start with the IETF as one example of how these organizations can work. How would you characterize the IETF? Um, so I would characterize it in, in a sort of a loving way as, as sort of a, it's a very distributed, I almost sort of a hippie kind of, you don't have to pay to play. Anybody who shows up has an influence. Uh, they hold open meetings and most of the activity, most of the decision and the explorations actually done online. So you can participate from anywhere in the world asynchronously. It's, a, it's really an organization that I'm really amazed how many key planetary level standards end up uh, hosted by the IETF from lots and lots of places. So I really think of it as a very sort of everybody can contribute, loosely connected uh, set of people from all walks of life. Um, that's kind of how I characterize the IETF. Yeah, I, would, I think that's right. It's a, it's a special organization. It's also, I think it's a very humbling experience to to take part in it because if you if you go to any of these meetings or you participate online right you, you realize that the people there are super engaged super nice super smart right? so it's yeah. really it's a pretty amazing place i think to to participate in and it's it's everybody can do it right there's no you don't need to formally join you don't don't need to pay any fees it's really it's a very 
kind of democratic and a very open process of doing that. And, and most of the people do it as a volunteer job. There are a handful of people, but there's a small group inside the IETF family that you know do the administrivia of the IETF. There's a handful of people who participate primarily as part of their, their work remit, but most of the people in the organization, they're volunteering their intelligence, their time, their effort, and that's a, that's a really humbling experience as well. That's a good point, I think. I always likened my, I, I've, I've been doing standards for a very long time, and I've always likened my, my work in that space as kind of community service, right? It's like, I'm in the IT sector, I'm all about open systems and, and so forth, right? So I think somebody needs to get that work done. And I think it's important that you have people who are doing it. So it's something where I think spending a little bit of time with it is, is good for everybody. And, it, and it's just really very interesting and, and rewarding, I think, in the end. You know, if you, if you contribute to something that afterwards actually gets used worldwide by many different people, that's kind of a nice feeling. Right? Yeah, I bet it is. Yeah. And that, that's different than another, slightly different than another body that I think you and I have both been active in, and that's the W3C. Right. The WC3 is really where we got some of the initial, uh, that's where HTML is hosted and a lot of these sort of web-based standards. It's a little bit different in that you have to, you have to pay to be a part of, uh, of the process. You have to be invited in as an expert. I've been invited in as an expert before, but they have a slightly different approach to, to the way they, they do the work, right? You've worked on some W, several W3C standards, right? Yeah, yeah, I've participated in a, a couple of groups over the years. Um, yeah, they, I think the word, the way they work is very different. It's it's not as open. The standards are open, so that yeah. that's the part I like. The standards are openly accessible. Anybody can read them and use them, so that's nice. But it's definitely already, I think, quite a different just way how they get stuff. Done. Yeah, yeah, their operating model is a little different, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep, but yep. it's still pretty open, I would say. Yeah. And it's kind of unique in the sense that, you know, it's headed by Tim Berners-Lee, right? So the guy who invented the web is, is, the, is the leader of the organization. So, so that makes it special. Yeah. But yep. there also are, let's say, more traditional standards organizations that work in the standards space just in general, right? And let's also look at those briefly and the example that probably most people would know is ISO, which weirdly stands for, I think, the organization for, no, International Standards Organization, yes, something like that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, there you go. Um, and, and that one is very well known, I think, because they just make so many standards, right? Yeah, all over, right? Not just IT, just all sorts of things. Product management standards, management standards in general, you know, even sort of uh, in the way you organize your company and the way you do your accounting, all that stuff. It's this, it's this wide, wide body of, of lots of things. And, and that's very much a, it's a very hierarchical kind of organization, right? Where I characterize that ETF as pretty freewheeling and distributed. ISO is, has got a, a definite hierarchy about it and things don't necessarily move so quickly. And I think it's primarily because ISO influences governments around the world, the way governments operate, the way legal standards are set and so on and so forth. So it has a kind of a different feel and a different pace. I've never actually been involved in uh, establishing or working on an ISO standard. So I don't really know for sure what really goes on inside. I think the way, yeah, neither have I. I think the way it works is really that it's, it's kind of strictly Populated the groups are populated by people who are appointed by the national standards bodies, right? So it's yes. a very kind of traditional government style kind of thing where like people need to join that formally and they need to be appointed somehow. And you know, it's like, yeah, yeah so I don't know. But they, I mean, they do a lot of they also, I think, you know, and then like to give them credit, right? They also do a lot of thankless oh, yeah. kind of busy work, right? So they, yeah. they keep an up-to-date list of which countries are there, which languages are there, and like all yeah. these things, right? Where, well, we need a list of that, and it changes yeah. all the time. So somebody needs yeah. to keep that list. So I know, I know I that I depend on ISO standards all the time, just like you had said, languages, country codes, uh, area, you know, telephone dialing, all these other things. I depend on them all the time. 
Yeah, I think what ISO, ISO has literally tens of thousands of standards. So I think we use their standards in so many ways that in most cases we don't realize, but I think they are built into pretty much everything that we're doing. Yeah, the, the camera I'm using, the microphones, the lights, all this stuff actually are affected by ISO standards, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But it's still like ISO, let's say it's still kind of a cross-cutting organization in the sense yeah. that they do everything, right? And they do yeah. standards in many different areas, let's say. And, and distinguishing against that, we can also look at a fourth and final type of organization that is more specific for a certain area. And these are industry consortia. So would you have an example for something like that? Um, so I would think of in the IT space, OASIS. I don't quite remember what the, what the uh, acronym is, but OASIS I is do. a... Do you? Do you know? Oh, tell me. Tell me. I, I do remember that name because it's such a funny name. It's the Organization for the Advancement of Structured Information Standards. And for some reason... This is burned into my brain and it will never leave. That's great. I learned that. I learned another thing today. That's very, very <laughs> cool. But but they would be an example, right, of a sort of a consortia of, of, of organizations. It's another example. I think we have to you have to pay to join, right? If I if I remember correctly, it's not quite as is as, as hierarchical so. as ISO, but it has some of that same feel to it, right? It has. Um, but actually, you know, just be forgot that about ISO. So for to Oasis credit, if, if you go to Oasis and you look at some of the standards they did, such as OData, which is a mm -hmm. fairly popular standard, I would say, at least you can just read the standard. If you go to ISO, you cannot read their standards. You have to buy them, right? They're yeah. not open. That's the part I still find very strange about ISO, that their standards are not just openly available, but for some reason, that's what they've decided to do. Yep. And with Oasis, it's a little different. And yes, I think Oasis is financed mostly through membership fees. That's yep. the way they yep. run things. Yep. And it's it's kind of it's really is pay to play, right? You if if you want to participate, you, your company needs to be a member, and then you can join these technical committees and participate in the standardization work. Yep. But they do have published, I think, a fair number of relevant standards in that space, in, in let's say oh, yeah. our space. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I run into ACES standards uh, um, very often, uh, mostly at large corporate organizations that they'll, they'll be using some OASIS standards of some type. OData is the great example. I was just, uh, I for a short time, I was sponsored into the OData group uh, uh, by Microsoft. And um, that gave me sort of a, you know, a clue in to how they operated um, but that's an example that I still uh, encounter yeah. several times. Yeah. Another one that you mentioned in the beginning, MQTT, right? MQTT also is Oasis. That's right. Um, that's right. Yeah. That's that's exactly right. So I, I actually I'm, encounter it very often now. Now I now I'm remembered. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably that was a long time ago. I think at least yeah. the first versions. I don't even know where it's now. But uh, yeah, that's that's another Oasis one. Good. Okay. I think we've covered like a good space in terms of you know talking about standards so we first talked about the differences of modular versus monolithic ways of using standards and i think we both are definitely in the school of thought that modular may be in, in most cases maybe the more useful approach to do then we talked a little bit about this kind of maturity model of standards going from pet Parents, personal community, and then to kind of industry and finally kind of global standards. And now we've also talked about some organizations that are active in that space. Are there any final words you would like to, to have about, you know, standards, why it's important to look at them, and why maybe they're more relevant than most people might think? Well, you know, I, there, there are a couple of things we talked about in the beginning. They really affect all of us every single day. So standards are important uh, for lots of reasons. I think the point you made, which I really, I, I really take to heart, which is the idea that the ability to uh, contribute to to the global information ecosystem is, it, you know, being a part of a standards group, even just participating in a standards group, gives you gives you a chance to influence what's going on. A lot of organizations, one of the things I encourage them to do is 
for whatever standards you're using, HTTP, OData, uh, problem details, whatever that is, have at least one person in your ecosystem, in your organization, that is involved or at least monitoring or is at least uh, participating in, in these standards groups. So they can sort of give you a heads up. They can help you know what's coming up. You know, HTTP has gone through several versioning uh, uh, iterations. It's about to start another one again. You're using HTTP. You're probably going to want to know what's going on there. So staying in touch, staying in tune is really, really important. So a chance to contribute, a chance to stay in touch with uh, with something that affects your own organization. And then just this notion of, of having this opportunity to interact with all of these super smart people affecting us in a lot of ways. I've always found, for example, IETF events very energizing for me. And I would encourage you, if you haven't participated before, even if you're just an individual, get involved. I think you may find it's actually a really enjoyable experience. It definitely is an experience. I think that that is definitely true. And I, I, I would totally like to support what you said about participation or at least observation that I think at least in relatively large organizations that have a considerable API ecosystem where people are building APIs just as, as something that's just going on all the time, it's definitely worth the investment to monitor at least the most important standards group to see what's going on, to regularly check is there something you know new coming up that we could use that would make yeah. life easier for us would make life easier for our API consumers, right? So that again could be something that could be very helpful. And I yep. think that is something that I don't see as much as I would like it to see. And I think sometimes people are intimidated to follow that and they think it's all kind of too complicated, but I don't think it's so bad. It can be something, you know, you just do it every, I don't know, every two weeks for half day or whatever, right? It doesn't need to be that much time. Yeah, I think I, I think that's right. I will say that I felt a you know a bit of an imposter syndrome when I began because, like we said, these are super smart people working on things you know that affect millions and millions, tens of millions, maybe billions of people. But like you say, just reading the list, spending a little time getting to know uh, people are very helpful, very friendly, and I would encourage everybody. This actually reminds me, not that this is a good plug because I haven't done that in a while, but when we were at, at uh, API Academy, I did start this standards daily thing, you know, like a, yeah. Twitter, a Twitter handle where I was trying yeah. to, you know, update regularly just some news from the standards world. And somehow yeah. I totally dropped that. Maybe that's something I should revive I, because it was I also would, a good yeah. one. I love it because I, I definitely subscribe to that list and there would always be reading material for me. I could count on you on that feed to say, oh, wow, look at that. They, I didn't realize that's a standard. And that would be something to read. So I definitely would encourage you. I think we should all encourage Eric to do more work. Start another <laughs> yeah, feed. More work. <laughs> <Have> another list. <laughs> that is very good. I was so bored and uh, <laughs> now I know what to do. Now you know what to do. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that, Mike. That's a wonderful uh, thing. And now I have to leave to you know reactivate the Twitter handle, but it's still alive. <laughs> I haven't seen any updates. But... There you go. There you go. Okay. It's good to talk with you. Yep. Yep. Once again, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for being on the show. Uh, I think, as usual, our next topic is highly secret. Um, highly but secret. again, it will be something in the space of what would the web do. So standards is something the web definitely does. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or any recommendations, what to do next, please leave a comment. And with that, that's it for today. Thanks a lot for tuning in. And until next time, bye. Bye-bye.